Spring Report. Um, with that said, let's kick things off. So uh, for today's webcast, we'll start off with Uli from Hamburg Messe in Congress, uh, who will give you a bit of input about uh, Wind Energy Hamburg, their support of the Global Wind Report 2019, and uh, up the upcoming Wind Energy Hamburg event in September. Over to you, Uli. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today here at the Global Wind Energy Community. My name is Uli Selbach, and I represent Wind Energy Hamburg, the global on and offshore event. And we are very proud uh, that we are the sponsor of the great Global Wind Report. Um, in the time of also some fake news, it's, it's good that we are having solid uh, facts and data um, um, also here from, um, from GVEC. And also we are happy that GVEC is our long-term partner for Wind Energy Hamburg together with Wind Europe. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about Wind Energy Hamburg this year. First of all, uh, what about Corona and our event in uh, late September? As all of you guys, uh, we have been working uh, from home for the past two weeks. There will also be next week and uh, around Easter a partial shutdown, shutdown of our own company, um, with the exception of, uh, for example, the Wind Energy Hamburg team. Um, so we are asking ourselves, and many of, of, of you are asking us, will Wind Energy Hamburg take place uh, from the 22nd to the 25th of September this year? To give you an honest answer, we don't know. But for now, we are very much convinced that it will take place. For one thing is, we see at the moment many organizers worldwide postponing their shows to late summer and fall this year. So if you take all the wisdom together of all the show organizers worldwide, second half of 2020 feels quite safe. Also, when we look back with experience with, with the SARS or EVEC or other um, uh, pandemias. Um, but again, uh, we, we, we hope, we are convinced, but we don't know. But what we also see is that at the moment, um, our Chinese customers are back. So what we see at the moment is quite a high request from China for even more space with new applications uh, for Wind Energy Hamburg in the end of September. So that's the status right now. Um, there will be some date in early summer where we make a decision if we cancel or if we postpone, we will talk to our partners in regards to that too, and then take it from there. Talking about Wind Energy Hamburg, what is, uh, what is new? One thing what is new, we have a long-term cooperation with GVEC. When GVEC is strong worldwide, uh, developing new markets, it makes even our global show stronger. Uh, we have a long-term cooperation with our co-organizer, uh, Wind Europe, and we have some um, new uh, nice tools at the show. So we will, status of today, have the same size with about 65,000 square meters routes and some 1,400 exhibitors from all over the world. We see that the number of exhibitors from China, France, and Spain has increased um, significantly. Um, we will have again a conference, but this time only the main conference uh, about the political summit will be uh, where you have to pay for it, organized by, by uh, Wind Europe. And then we have three open stages. And uh, those open stages are in three different halls and they are open and free for everyone. And one is the global business stage run by GVEC and Wind Europe. Um, that will cover mainly non-European markets and how to do business there. The other one will be empowering people, um, a stage run by Wind Europe, and focus on the human side of the energy transition, health and safety, skills, acceptance of wind energy and permitting happy coexistence with communities and other sex stakeholders, such as maritime uh, planners, community engagement, and biodiversity preservation. The third stage is about power to climate. And that's about the downstream side of the energy transition. Electrification of energy consumers like heating transport, 
as well as energy storage and green hydrogen. So a lot is going to happen at the show in, um, in September. And we are proud that we're not only by far the number one show for, for on and offshore, but just for offshore, 40% of our fairground is reserved uh, by the exhibitors. That's from my side. That was the, the little um, uh, commercial block from the main sponsor of uh, the Global Wind Report. And now I hand over back to the experts and friends from GVEC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uli. And uh, I know at GWAC, we're really looking forward to working on the Global Business Insights stage um, for Win Energy Hamburg in September. Um, so now we'll move on um, to, and I'll give the stage to our CEO, Ben Backwell, who will provide some insights um, from the Global Win Report 2019 um, and the overview of what happened in the wind energy industry last year. So over to you, Ben. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining us in these uh, difficult times. And um, yeah, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through just some of the top line um, uh, numbers. Um, uh, Feng Zhao, who's our strategy director, is gonna go through the numbers and the trends in kind of more detail. Um, and um, and then Joyce Lee, our policy director, is gonna look at. Um, uh, the policy questions that we're highlighting around the report. Um, so I just want to really just go over the kind of headline numbers and um, make a few points around what uh, GWEC is, is doing and how GWEC is seeing uh, the world um, at the moment going forward. So I'm just going to do that um, you know, fairly, fairly quickly. So I think the, fir the first thing to say is that it was a pretty good year. Um, it was 60 0.4 uh, gigawatts. That's the second biggest year in terms of annual installations that the wind market has had so far in history. Um, obviously, the very, you know, the very, very big year uh, was in uh, 2015, um, and I think the causes are fairly similar to in 2015. So the main factor has been uh, anticipated phase out feed-in tariffs in China. Um, and as you'll see, China um, accounted for a very large part of the growth um, in, in 2019. Um, <clears throat> and then I guess uh, to a lesser degree, um, the planned uh, PTC phase out in the US, where, which meant that the US also had a very good year. Um, and then behind that, um, you know, kind of good market growth um, in many other places, uh, with some markets coming back very strongly, uh, like Spain, for instance, in Europe, um, and then um, global um, offshore, which had a record year and um, uh, is now 10% of the market um, you know, for the first time. So I'll just look at a couple of those things. I mean, the first thing to note is just that you know, growth was disproportionately concentrated in the US and China. So US and China alone made up 60% of the total installations in 2019. Obviously, they're, they're two of the, the two biggest single uh, markets and then Europe kind of collectively coming uh, uh, behind that. Um, and then um, also, um, as I mentioned, global uh, offshore. Now, those uh, factors around um, expiration of the feed-in tariffs in 2019 in China PTC expiry, we expect those factors to continue to drive the market um, also this year as well. So it's not just a, a, a one off, but it is um, something that you know, doesn't doesn't um, you know, last forever. It is a transitional um, uh, thing. Um, can I have the ne next slide, please, uh, uh, Marina? OK, so just to illustrate that. So Asia Pacific in terms of new capacity is 50.7%. So the Europe uh, collectively 25.5% and then North America 16.1%. Uh, and then if you look at the countries, um, China is 43.3% of the total, which is you know, obviously a phenomenal um, proportion. And we saw that um, in 2015, um, also a similar trend. And then you have the US with 15%, the United Kingdom you know, through offshore, uh, 
India at 3.9, Spain at 3.8, which you know, is a very interesting and strong comeback there from Spain. Um, and then others at uh, 29.8. Um, next one, please. And then, um, you know, again, just to kind of show the concentration. So the top five onshore markets, um, you know, um, uh, you know, account for a 72% uh, of the entire uh, world. And obviously, from a GWEC point of view and, and from a policy point of view, that's not a good thing in our view. Um, what we're seeing around the world is that a lot of other markets are stop go or are underperforming. Um, so it's really those top markets that have kind of brought us through to this kind of strong uh, growth year. And obviously that um, needs to change. You know, we need to have a more uniform uh, growth across uh, the world markets and other markets kind of picking up um, and accelerating. Um, and then just to look at um, new capacity by support mechanism. So as you can see, China still has feeding tariffs. They're now transitioning um, away from that. They're 44 percent um, market based in that. You know, we're talking about um, auctions, tenders, uh, green certificates, um, merchant. That's um, 35 percent. And then um, US uh, PTC is 15 percent. Um, next one, please. OK, and then just to look at the country ranking. So again, People's Republic of China, USA, India, Spain, Sweden is a very notable addition. Sweden, Sweden's market's been doing very, very well, um, very dynamic. Uh, France, 2%. Um, Mexico, 2%. So this is, this is purely onshore. Um, Germany, 2%. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, Germany, um, I would say is one of the underperforming uh, markets along with uh, India. Um, and then offshore, instantly we have, in terms of new installations, we have uh, China in first place, uh, 39% um, as the single biggest national market, followed by the UK, which has been the kind of traditional leader, uh, followed by Germany, followed by Denmark, followed by Belgium. Now, if you look at the cumulative installations, so what we call total installations, um, in onshore, it's China, US and Germany um, that lead, uh, followed by India. And then um, in offshore, you can see that the UK still has the biggest uh, installed capacity, uh, followed by Germany, followed by China. But obviously, if China's uh, growth rate in offshore continues, then China will obviously you know, push up those rankings and will overtake uh, Germany uh, pretty quickly and then uh, uh, the UK. Um, soon after that. Um, next one, please. Okay, so this one here is looking at, you know, where does the growth come from? And this is not the absolute growth. This is the additional growth compared to 2018 uh, installations. So you can see, you know, China um, uh, did pretty well and added kind of an additional chunk of growth. Uh, the USA, the same thing. Um, now, if you look at LATAM and um, Africa and Middle East, they still showed growth, you know, um, year on year. But the the growth in terms of in ter uh, compared to last year's growth, um, it was slower. So growth has decelerated uh, in Latin America and Africa. Um, Europe, uh, pretty decent year in terms of new growth. Uh, India, um, you know, some growth. Uh, but we would say that India is still um, underperforming uh, compared to where it you know, needs to be according to its national targets and in terms of um, execution. And I guess uh, what's interesting is we flagged up uh, last year in Bilbao when we presented the results that the two biggest kind of, um, you know, kind of underperformers uh, were Germany and India. And we'd still say that's the case in terms of kind of where we should be in terms of you know the size of markets and national you know growth targets um and we you know we would expect those two markets to be kind of consistently in the in the top um kind of you know uh, three or four and and they um you know uh, uh you know need to accelerate uh, uh further um and then you can see offshore you know, there's a there's a kind of healthy chunk of kind of new growth on top of last year's uh, growth as well. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, and then this is offshore. You can see pretty phenomenal uh, growth. Um, you know, we're up to, um, um, I think we had, we had growth of 6.1 uh, gigawatts. You can see where that's uh, come from. China had a new record, uh, 2.3 gigawatts in a single year. Um, but there's also been very significant um, developments. I mean, the UK CFD allocation um, that showed a record low strike price, um, uh, 39 uh, pounds to 41 pounds a megawatt hour. Um, the Netherlands holding its second zero subsidy tender. Um, the US increasing its targets. Uh, Taiwan connecting uh, grid capacity. Um, and we can see a lot of positive trends in offshore, uh, both with countries accelerating their ambition. So we've seen Europe um, accelerating its ambition and key countries uh, like the UK and Germany accelerating their ambition. Um, the, you know, talking now about uh, Europe reaching 450 gigawatts by 2050, um, large ambitions for the rest of the world. Um, and we're also talking about increasing amounts of new countries uh, taking offshore wind as a kind of serious ambition um, and starting to incorporate offshore wind as a kind of large um, uh, chunk of their kind of forward planning on, on power. So um, our view from GWEC is that offshore wind will continue to gain momentum. Uh, we're working um, with our partners, associations and, and uh, companies around the world in places like Japan and Taiwan, um, Vietnam and India um, and the US and other places and, um, um, and also working with uh, the World Bank um, on non-OECD uh, new um, offshore markets. Um, and we can only expect that policy momentum to continue to, uh, uh, to gain, um, um, gain speed. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so just, I mean, a few points just to wrap up from my point of view. I mean, I mean, first of all, we, you know, as an industry, you know, we're ready to scale up um, and to meet the climate challenge. Uh, but I would say at the moment, installations are lagging behind uh, in terms of what the world needs and in terms of what um, climate uh, ambition is. I mean, if you work backwards from the IPCC report and the Paris Accords, you know, the wind industry should be installing, you know, probably twice as much as we are installing uh, right now. I mean, we should be uh, consistently at over 100 gigawatts a year. We should be rising quickly to 200 gigawatts a year. So we really need to go into a kind of accelerated uh, growth uh, uh, period. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think as an industry in terms of our technology and where we are, we're ready to step up. But we need to fix um, certain things. Um, uh, to get into that kind of period of accelerated growth. So, I mean, we're an incredibly exciting industry. We're still one of the major kind of growth industries and success stories of the world. But in order to meet climate ambition, we need to be even bigger and go even faster. Um, the second big point that we've made in the report is that um, the ability to execute and uh, accelerate deployment is being held up by inadequate regulation in many major markets. And again, I mean, I'd go back to some of these examples of, you know, your Indias and your uh, Germany's where, you know, auctions are, are happening and capacity is awarded, but the ability to be able to execute and build at the right speed is severely constrained by regulation that's not fit for purpose. So I think if anything, I mean, our, our real point, you know, uh, for, um, 2020 is that we need to focus on execution, on implementation, on, on uh, getting things done uh, without sounding too much like my uh, Prime Minister, um, Boris, Boris Johnson. But um, I think, um, you know, getting the energy transition done is really kind of what we're, we're focused on and, and on the kind of practical concerns of the wind industry of, of implementation and working very closely, you know, with governments and stakeholders to try and um, accelerate uh, implementation. And I think um, the other point to make is that many markets are just stop go. Uh, so we are seeing in places like, you know, Brazil and Mexico that have had very promising markets that you get some kind of stop go, you know, patterns where, you know, the new power is being um, tendered for, but when there's some kind of economic problem or political change, quite often those, you know, programs kind of, you know, stop for a while and then start again. We see that, you know, in places like Argentina that were very promising, Mexico um, and other places around the world. So it's a kind of stop start um, 
environment for many places and it needs to be a steady accelerated growth. Um, the other point we're making in the report, which I'd urge all of you to read is that we need to go beyond LCOE. So LCOE is not enough in itself. If the critical challenges are not met around infrastructure and planning and the enabling environment, we simply won't be able to um, execute and implement at the right scale, even if we're slower, uh, sorry, even if we're more competitive um, uh, than on paper than uh, fossil fuels and other alternatives. Uh, it won't happen at the right pace because what needs to happen is that incumbent existing fossil fuel power needs to get pushed off the grid um, in a steady way. Um, otherwise, we won't carry out the energy uh, transition fast enough. Um, fourth point is that COVID-19, the virus, will considerably impact the wind industry in 2020. Um, now, we um, expect at the moment uh, most of the delayed capacity to be spilt over simply into 2021. And that's also what the analysts, um, you know, other analysts like uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance are also predicting at the moment. They came out with their numbers yesterday. Uh, they had a 12% hit on their predicted 20, uh, 2020 growth. Uh, but with all of that being spilt over to 2021 and we're in GWEC, we're in a similar uh, we have a similar kind of view. I mean, we're looking at maybe a, you know, something up to 15% um, uh, hit maybe in 2020. But don't forget that 2020 was set to be a very, very big year. It was actually set to be a new record year, you know, growth um, of over uh, 70, uh, uh, 70 gigawatts uh, this year rather than, you know, 60. And um, again, we would expect uh, things to spill over to 2021. But the big question is, how long does this go on for? Uh, because if we can take the delay till now, then we can kind of see, OK, um, you know, most stuff just gets postponed into 2021. If, if the disruption um, impact and uh, um, the impact starts to be on investment decisions, then obviously it has a more midterm um, effect um, and all the effects around economic recession, um, power demand, relative competitiveness of wind and all those kind of questions uh, come into play kind of more midterm. Um, GWEC is setting up its COVID uh, response hub, which was launched today. We've been working behind the scenes with associations um, uh, since this thing started in, in January in China um, um, and working very closely with associations to try and help operations continue, minimize uh, disruptions uh, uh, in a way that's uh, you know safe, uh, but which uh, ensures that we can continue as a vital uh, industry. Um, and we're also uh, uh, looking very much at um, how the world economy comes out of this. Uh, so my last point finally is that yeah, the wind industry needs to step up. I mean, the world, the world will come out of this. Economic growth will resume. Uh, there will be massive stimulus plans around the world. We're already seeing some of those. And the wind industry needs to kind of be present, have its head held up. It needs to be operating intact. It needs to have its lobby uh, intact and, and prominent through organizations like, you know, GWEC and Wind Europe and our partner associations. Um, and we really need to be present um, and part of the discussion um, at the time when governments um, implement uh, and conceive of their stimulus plans. Um, and then looking further ahead, you know, the climate question is still there. Um, and um, when economies bounce back, the climate emergency will become you know, front and center again uh, fairly rapidly. And the, um, you know, the world will wake up to the fact that we're still in, in an emergency here. So very, very important that um, climate's not forgotten and that wind is ready uh, to play its part in any bounce back. Um, um, and, and part of the wider debate about um, getting the uh, climate and uh, energy transition done. So that's it from me. I'm gonna hand over to Feng Zhao, our strategy director, who's gonna give a bit more um, uh, color and uh, granularity on the, on the report. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, now we'll, we'll move over um, to the market outlook and further analysis on the impact of COVID-19 on the wind industry. Um, so I'll give the floor to Fong Zhao, who is GWEC's strategy director. Over to you, Fong. 
Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so, follow on what Ben presented in terms of the performance of the global wind industry in 2019. And now I'm going to take this uh, opportunity to bring the conversation a little bit further, looking at the market growth in the next five years. Um, the data um, Ben presented uh, earlier indicate um, 2019 is uh, one of the best year, uh, actually this, the highest after 2015, that's uh, the, the best year, but more than 20 gigawatt installation, absolutely it's uh, uh, outstanding. Um, we had China, US as the largest uh, um, contributor in terms of the uh, annual installation and looking at the market outlook uh, in the next five years, uh, in general, uh, we can see uh, we will have even a big year uh, waiting for us for 2020. Um, we, we, we already discussed here in this web, webcast, we are facing the um, challenge in terms of COVID, um, but uh, we're going to address the challenge um, globally. But before we, we uh, move on to uh, the impact, let me quickly go through our outlook for the global market, uh, what we did um, at earlier uh, Q1 2020. Uh, so looking at the uh, annual installation uh, without taking into account of the impact of COVID-19, we believe that uh, 2020 will absolutely be a um, good year. Uh, it's mainly due to uh, the two largest markets, US and China, where we have the deadline. Uh, in, in China, we have the um, end of this year for onshore wind grid uh, connection deadline in order to qualify uh, the previous approved um, fitting tariff project in the US. Uh, developer got to um, be quick to get the project built by the end of this year uh, to, quanti uh, to qualify uh, this 100% PTC value. And so uh, data in 2019 already indicate two countries bought up nearly half of the uh, global new installation. So 2020, that's that's going to be the same case, actually probably even higher. Um, looking at those market, we forecast uh, for, for onshore and uh, offshore, both countries are going to build up nearly 45, uh, 45 gigawatts. So that's more than half of what we believe um, to be built in 2020. And so uh, there we have this uh, five years growth chart here. Uh, what looking at the drivers behind of the growth uh, in the near term, especially in 2020, we still believe that um, the uh, fitting tariff and also PTC uh, will be the majority drivers for the near term growth. That's the 2020. Um, for the rest of the market, uh, we will continue to see um, the market scheme mainly auction to be the drivers. Uh, however, start from 2021, um, the picture will slightly different. Even though in the US, we believe that PTC will remain as, as a key drivers in terms of growth. And also uh, we indicate in our report uh, in the US um, in December, 2019, uh, the Senate has passed a new uh, tax extender deal, which offer one year ex uh, extension for the new project build. So this probably will drive another wave of installation rush um, uh, in 2024. And so that's the US. On top of PDC, we also see uh, the state level uh, RTS and also uh, corporate PPA, that's uh, one of the key drivers in the United States. And looking at the market uh, outside US, um, start from 2021, China, uh, it's a, a big market in terms of community for new installation. So I'm sure when they are going to start, will be the first country kick off the uh, subsidiary zero. So that's a, a, a big, um, big impact in terms of the uh, market outlook. And uh, in Europe, Latin America, 
uh, Africa, Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Uh, looking at the purchase pipeline, we believe that the market-based mechanism, including either pure win options or hybrid or technical neutral option, for example, in Finland, uh, those um, market-based mechanism will drive the market growth uh, in those uh, market. Uh, corporate PPI, I already mentioned in the US, uh, our data uh, presented in the annual report uh, it's clear uh, we continue to see the growth of the corporate PPA, uh, that's the, the uh, direct deal. Um, it's on the growth curve uh, in United States. Um, we, we, it's uh, the largest market in terms of corporate PPA, but we see the growth uh, um, outside the US as well. Uh, in 2019, um, the data according to um, Bloomberg Levin Finance uh, is indicating nine gigawatt has been signed corporate PPA, uh, which is 30 percent of growth um, on what has been signed uh, a year ago. Um, so right now, um, looking at the, the market outside the U.S., we actually saw quite a lot of uh, um, direct deal corporate PPA. Uh, in North America, for example, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, also here, uh, where I'm based in Scandinavia, we have a corporate deal signed as well. And right now, looking at market in Southeast Asia country like Vietnam, they are looking at the potential opportunity in terms of corporate, P corporate PPA as well. So we believe that this will continue, uh, the, the trends will continue, and corporate PPA will uh, grow the market share uh, in general. Uh, looking at the growth chart, you can see on top of this uh, five years outlook, uh, the um, blue numbers, that's the pure offshore. So uh, as Ben mentioned, um, 2019 offshore passed the milestone of six gigawatt. That's the best year ever. Uh, it's already bring the uh, offshore market share in global new installation um, to surpassed the milestone of 10%. Uh, so that's a, a big achievement for the offshore industry alone. As I mean, it's been more than two decades, uh, finally we are here. Uh, looking at the offshore uh, in the next five years, actually the picture is look even better. Um, 2020, uh, we, we will see similar growth um, globally around six gigawatt uh, to be built. Um, the start from 2021, we will see uh, more offshore one to be built. Um, looking at the end of the forecast uh, year 2024, 15 gigawatt it's likely to be built. If that's the case, which will bring um, the market share um, of new built offshore one into the global total new one into uh, even 20 percent. That's uh, uh, absolutely uh, a, a promising uh, market. So. Uh, before I go back uh, to the next, uh, go to the next slide regarding the burden up of new market forecast by region, I just want to mention that uh, uh, our GY mark uh, forecast, uh, the, the outlook uh, is mainly based on uh, our internal um, database and also we have the market intelligent team where we're looking at different country profile policy and also we got, uh, you know, every year, well, this beginning of this year, we start working with the national or regional uh, association, get the data for the previous year. In the same time, we get the input for the next five years. Uh, also, uh, we also share our forecast numbers with leading um, turbine OEMs. They are our board member as well. Back in the fall, uh, we, we, we had this uh, uh, dialogue on each quarter. Um, so we take into account uh, all the input from the stakeholders uh, active throughout the value chain. And also uh, we blend it uh, based on the knowledge we have in-house. Um, for onshore when um, near term, more like top down, uh, bottom up approach. Um, after another um, two years after, it's more like the top down approach. But for offshore, I just want to make it clear, uh, as GWAG Market Intelligence, um, we offer in the global offshore project database, we have the historic information and also we offer project under structure, that's the pipeline. Uh, internally, we have the project pipeline and for each single country, including uh, emerging market, for example, when we saw the, um, the 
with a one gig of offshore opportunity in Philippines yesterday, we, we have those information including our pipeline. So again, our offshore uh, market lot look is quite robust. Uh, we have the detailed uh, uh, information on the project bench, which is available to our members and also subscribers to GY Market Intelligence. Now let's take a look at the um, global market outlook by region. Next slide, please, Alicia. So looking at the uh, next five years outlook um, by region, uh, in general, uh, this uh, color um, bar chart indicates uh, where the majority of the wind will be built. It, it is clear looking at the 2020, so we have China, Europe, North America, many US will have the majority of the installation. Uh, however, you, you can see the up and down in terms of the uh, new installation per region. Um, but in general, uh, the main trends uh, won't change. You can see these three key regions, um, China, uh, Europe, North America, uh, even though the market will drop a bit, um, start from 2023 in China. But again, those three regions together will have uh, the majority, uh, more than half of the global new growth uh, in the next five uh, uh, years. Um, regarding the specific market uh, analysis um, per region, and let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, this slide uh, uh, indicates uh, how many uh, new onshore offshore went to be built. Uh, so on the right corner, we have one box with a circle with uh, a line around it. That's the pure offshore. So we, we separate our forecast uh, into onshore offshore. This is small box indicate uh, the offshore market. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we we see the milestone has been reached in 2019 with more than 10% of the market for new growths and uh, for offshore alone. Uh, for the next five years offshore wind, we believe that uh, will, offshore wind will be built, start from 2023, uh, offshore will become a truly global business. Um, uh, even though we see, okay, 10% milestone has been reached, but looking at the distribution per region, the, the growth, uh, especially for 2019, mainly from Europe, um, primarily uh, UK, um, Germany, and then China. Um, but then look at the outlook, uh, we will start from uh, 2023, where we can, we believe that more when they will be built uh, from APAC region, not just China, we will see uh, Taiwan, Japan, a, a bit from South Korea as well, and also in Vietnam. Uh, looking at uh, uh, the North America, uh, in the US, uh, we see a quite strong pipeline, even though we don't have new wind built um, in 2019 and uh, only one demonstration project in 2020. Uh, however, the utility scale of your wind will um, be built online uh, tower 2023. Uh, so there are six gigawatt um, in the pipeline, according to the construction plan, the, those utility plan to build uh, nearly 10 gigawatt um, by 2026. That's a tremendous um, um, cap capacity uh, in the pipeline there. That's uh, uh, offshore. And now let's take a look. Uh, the first bar chart uh, uh, at the bottom, uh, that's for America. Looking at America, uh, in North America, the, the key drivers, as we mentioned, as mainly uh, United States, we have uh, the five-year PTC phase out plus one-year extension. So it will guarantee the volume. Um, the uh, neighbor country, uh, um, Canada, uh, we see uh, relatively no growth uh, in 2019, but looking at the pipeline, we believe um, there will be around one gigawatt um, plus um, I'm sure one to be built in 2020 and 2021. Um, 
across the border and uh, looking at the Latin American uh, regions, um, we see the big market, Brazil, uh, is coming back. Um, ben already mentioned in his presentation earlier, uh, there is a stop and start um, challenge in, uh, in Brazil. Um, but however, uh, looking at the purchase pattern and option results and also the um, private market, we believe uh, the market will be back uh, on, uh, again on track start from 2020. Uh, apart from Brazil, we believe that the strong growth will, uh, in terms of new additions, um, the other three markets it's worth to watch, that's uh, including Mexico, Chile, uh, Argentina. So uh, looking at the region in Latin America alone, uh, we believe steep growth around four gigawatts uh, could be possible uh, moving forward on the annual basis for the next five years. And then uh, Europe, that's the chart uh, in the middle of the slides. Um, Euro Europe, we cover, uh, cover the EU 28 market and plus Eastern market, also um, Russia. Uh, looking at the, uh, the EU European Union uh, 28 market alone, uh, we believe the market will um, remain stable, uh, unsure when at the level of 11 to 12 uh, gigawatt in the next five years. If we take into account the volumes from the long EU country, including Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, also Ukraine, for example, uh, we will have a slightly higher number. The growth rate will maintain at something around uh, 13 um, gigawatt for the next five years. Um, then take a look the Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific, as we um, clearly indicate, um, China will continue to take the lead as the largest market in terms of new installation, actually both, both for, for both onshore and offshore. And the second largest market in this region, that's uh, India. Uh, we do have the challenge in terms of the transition from fitting tariff uh, into auction. The first auction start from February 2017. The market is not really uh, in the position where the industry expect to be. Um, so we have relatively low years uh, in 2018 and 19. Uh, after the the, uh, the rush uh, in 2017, uh, however, we believe that the working together with the government um, situation will be changed um, in terms of the grid transmission line, uh, etc. Uh, so we believe the market will start recovering from 2020, and the more to be built um, before uh, the deadline where the government have 60 gigawatt uh, target um, for for wind. Uh, on top of China, uh, India, uh, unsure why uh, in this region, uh, we believe that uh, actually Southeast Asia uh, has uh, great potential in terms of the growth. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, my colleague Li Ming now moved on um, from Beijing to Singapore as leading uh, the um, Nobby work, and we have the uh, Southeast Asia Task Force specifically to, to try to uh, promote the uh, renewable, uh, specifically wind, both onshore, offshore, and in this region. And we, we uh, this year, 2020, uh, looking at our forecasts uh, split by, by country, we have this data available for uh, all the GWAC members. You can see uh, we have um, quite significant pipeline in this line, uh, for example, and uh, the most recent um, policy change in Thailand uh, also brings some value back. Uh, again, uh, looking at Asia Pacific, um, uh, taking into account the uh, volume, uh, the additions to be built uh, in uh, Australia, so in total, uh, this region um, will play a significant role in terms of the new uh, onshore wind uh, in the next five years. Um, after APAC, now let's, let's take a look at the region for Africa and the Middle East. Uh, we see relatively uh, no value uh, compared with previous year, just a, a slight drop, but mainly due to uh, in 2019, we have Kenya 
uh, both in a, a quite big uh, project, more than 300 um, megawatt. Um, but again, uh, we believe stable growth uh, is possible. Uh, in the near term, for the next uh, three years, uh, the average growth um, for this region will be around 1.45 gigawatt. And to start from uh, 2023, the annual growth is, is, is likely to, to be doubled, mainly due to uh, the expected growth uh, increase of the annual growth in South Africa. Uh, the largest market in that region, also Egypt, stable growth uh, to be expected in Morocco as well. And also in uh, Middle East, we have the auction result um, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So all together, uh, we can see growth is uh, also expected uh, in those emerging markets in this region. Um, for, for offshore, uh, as I mentioned, uh, start from 2023 uh, will be truly global market. And uh, looking at the growth, I mean, 15 gigawatt uh, alone in 2024, that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, my colleague, uh, Alistair, is our chair for global, GY Global Offer Task Force uh, on this line as well. If you have some specific question in terms of growth in those emerging markets, you can just write down your question here, it will be answered. Um, now let's take a look at uh, the uh, impact of the coronavirus. Um, as Ben already indicated uh, here, uh, we, in general, uh, you know, uh, we see the challenge um, all over the world. That's not just uh, for the uh, Chinese market. Uh, the coronavirus, we all know, kick off uh, first uh, in, in China. Uh, from the end of January. Uh, it takes two months to get the virus under control. Uh, however, uh, we still see uh, in terms of the uh, fully production, the market uh, status. Um, by the end of uh, March yesterday, uh, we had a conversation with the, the industry. Uh, around 70% of the um, utilization rate. So. Uh, the local Chinese market, uh, even though um, the majority of work uh, has come back on track, but uh, we're not really uh, reaching the 100% uh, full utilization rate. Uh, right now in Europe here, we're still in the middle of the crisis. Um, it's the same situation in the US and also India, uh, one of the largest um, onshore market, um, globally speaking, um, also start a lockdown um, so this map uh, where we can see that's what we uh, put together earlier this week. Um, you can see this show the latest status in, in terms of global lockdown or travel ban. The dark color um, indicate where we have the fully lockdown and the, the, the light um, blue colors indicate those countries either have the travel ban or the partially lockdown. Uh, so in general, we can see uh, we have the channel throughout the global market and we're, especially for those key markets where we're talking about the China, India, Europe, North America, uh, all the region has been uh, impact. But looking at the value chain, uh, let's take a look at the next slide, please. So uh, at the GY, uh, as Ben mentioned, we're going to launch the um, Corona response uh, information hubs today. Uh, in our website where you can find out a map like this. If you um, put your mouse onto the map uh, in those uh, countries where we have uh, the, the highlight to uh, indicate uh, what's going on in each market. For example, right now, uh, industry-wise, um, we have uh, turbine nacelle assembly, uh, key component um, factory closed down in Spain, Italy, uh, in who in the UK for offshore SGRE uh, offshore plates, and also in India, uh, simplistically, we have the two leading supplier SGRE uh, Vistas uh, announced uh, earlier um, this week. Uh, they, they temporarily suspended the production. Uh, information, uh, the same information has been feedback to 
uh, our GeoX di um, disk is that the leading component supplier like LM Wind Power, and also I spoke with the leading gearbox producer, Zedit Venergy, uh, they all suspended the production. The NGC, the largest gearbox producer, they are building a new facility in India start from end of last year. They put the construction work on hold as well. And again, in China, uh, even though the country is not really uh, reopened after lockdown, but in terms of the flow of this uh, um, supply chain, it's, it's not really there like the pre-coronavirus. So uh, in general, looking at the global market, then indicate uh, our approach. Um, in our global wind report released uh, last week, um, we made it clear um, due to, you know, uh, the market out of China is still in the middle of a crisis. Uh, right now, uh, it's relatively uh, hard or not, we're not really in a position to quantify the exact impact. So we're going to, that's why we, we decided to build uh, on this slide, you can see the wind industry Corona-19 response hubs. We try to monitor what's going on in the industry policy-wise, uh, supply chain-wise, closely and also country mayors, uh, trying to uh, bring the information to our members, to the entire industry, make everything more transparent. So we know what's exactly going on. So we can go through the top time. In general, our guideline, especially for market where we have the lockdown, we believe that um, looking at what has been um, uh, learned in China, uh, normally two to three months uh, delay, that's uh, absolutely the case. Um, now we are in the middle of the crisis in Europe, um, uh, United States probably is will take longer to, to get it under control. Therefore, it's fair to say 15% uh, of the uh, downgrade in terms of the, the focus I just present, uh, that could be the case. Uh, we are going to present at the GWAC market intelligence the new market outlook uh, in Q2. Uh, more information will be uh, available. Um, so again, uh, welcome to go to our website to looking at what's going on um, uh, in the global wind industry policy-wise and supply chain-wise. We're working with our um, National Wind Association uh, directly. We have the dialogue with turbine OEM component suppliers um, okay, I think that's uh, uh, all I'm going to say. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Joy. Thank you. Thanks, Fang. Um, as you mentioned, we'll hand it off to uh, Joyce Lee, our Policy and Operations Director here at GWAC, who will give a bit more insights into how market design can uh, be a, an important tool to further accelerate the energy transition into the future. Uh, over to you, Joyce. Thanks, Listen Fung. Um, I'm going to try to keep it snappy because I want to leave enough time for questions among the group. Um, so thank you everyone for joining from your home today. Uh, thank you for choosing GWEC over the increasing number of webcasts and virtual meetings and Netflix content out there. We're very happy to meet with you. Um, and it, it's critical that, we're talk, that we talk about these challenges together as an industry. Uh, so Fung has touched on the short and medium term impacts of the ongoing pandemic on the health of our industry. And now I would like to step back to look at the longer term factors which are affecting industry sustainability, uh, drawing largely from the anchor chapter in our global wind report on market design to accelerate the energy transition. Um, today, there's around 650 gigawatts of operational capacity uh, for wind energy, and it's providing around 6% of global power generation. It took decades to reach this position, uh, and now we're facing the mission, as Ben mentioned, of accelerating onshore and offshore wind deployment to more than 100 gigawatts annually. Um, over the next 10 years, that means we need to reach a, a share of the global generation mix of one-fifth, and then up to 2050, that would look at that would look like a one third of a share for global generation for wind power. Um, this is under the global energy transformation scenario, which is um, has been put forward by IRENA according to IPCC um, planning and carbon budgets to maintain a 1.5 degree pathway. 
So during this presentation, I'm going to uh, briefly review the structural market issues which are holding back wind energy deployment and which need to be urgently resolved in order to deliver the energy transition. Um, these include grid and transmission constraints, uh, policy variability, um, creating stop start growth cycles in markets like South Africa, uh, weak signals to phase up fossil fuel generation, um, permitting issues, as well as a race to the bottom outlook on pricing, which among other factors has led to auctions going undersubscribed in markets like India. And on this last point, um, Alyssa, if you could click for the map. I just wanted to uh, note that wind is now recognized as one of the most cost competitive energy sources in markets around the world. Um, onshore and offshore wind costs have come down dramatically by um, some 50% in the last five years. But as a result, this has um, imposed increasing cost pressures for developers, OEMs, EPCs, service providers across the value chain. And that is very clearly reflected in the supply side con consolidation that we've seen. So for a global wind industry that once had more than 100 turbine manufacturers, today we have around 37 turbine manufacturers of which the top five are supplying two thirds of market share. And that means that there's building pressure to ensure that our industry can continue to grow sustainably and attract the necessary level of investments to deliver larger volumes of wind. Um, it's going to require system reforms and it's going to require a shift in our outlook to measure energy, not just on you know, OPEX, CAPEX calculations, LCOE terms, but in terms of system value within the context of system-wide decarbonization. And I'm going to return to that point shortly. Next slide. So I wanted to walk through the different enabling factors which need to be addressed, uh, starting with grid. And grid capacity is a key constraint for many markets, not just emerging wind markets, but also developed mature wind markets, and particularly high growth markets like the US and China, which as Ben mentioned, are dry, drove growth in 2019. So in the US following the phase out of the PTC in 2021, we're going to see grid availability becoming a very big challenge. Um, in China, uh, grid enhancement is going to be necessary in order to curb curtailment, um, particularly in those windy area, areas like uh, Gansu, Xinjiang, um, Inner Mongolia, um, where the government is now building ultra high voltage transmission networks to transport large wind power loads over long distances to demand centers around the country. Uh, grid investment is going to have to scale up by more than 25% from current levels to around uh, $374 billion per year. And it's important to note that this investment should not just be borne by the renewable energy actors who are seeking new connections and increased infrastructure. Um, governments also need to take responsibility for long-term grid planning and investment. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that the worldwide lockdown and quarantine measures that we're seeing now have demonstrated the importance of system flexibility. Um, power demand has dropped around the world in the recent weeks. I think IEA has put out um, a data point that shows it's dropped by 15% globally um, over the last few weeks. And that means in certain markets, we're seeing higher penetration rates of wind and solar. Um, as those shares of renewable energy grow, we're going to need greater um, mechanisms for flexibility and balancing in order to handle the supply patterns of sources like wind energy. We do go over a few of the flexibility solutions in our Global Wind Report. Um, they include hybridization, digitalization and demand side response, as well as economical storage solutions uh, like green hydrogen, um, particularly when paired with offshore wind. Next slide, please. So another very important enabling factor is permitting, um, particularly for those utility scale wind projects, um, which act as pathfinders in emerging wind markets. Uh, spurring you know, important things like industrial growth and job creation. They often need multiple um, and complex uh, permits and licenses for environment, construction, um, and, and land use, uh, among others. And uh, when this process becomes too onerous or too time intensive, it can really derail project timelines. Germany is a really good example of where you know, multiple permitting legal and administration challenges have really put a dent in the growth of new wind installations. So in 2017, that market saw a record 6.6 .6 gigawatts of onshore wind come online, but that has since dropped to just more than one gigawatt of onshore wind built in Germany last year. 
Um, this can be attributed to the rise of nimbyism in various parts of Germany, uh, the emergence of climate skepticism in the political process, as well as um, actions and interve interventions raised by um, the military, aviation sector, uh, and nature and wildlife groups. Um, it's affected around at least eight gigawatts of projects in the pipeline. Um, and one industry study found that the permitting durations for wind projects in Germany have tripled from 2010 to 2019. Um, it's become a very material problem uh, because uh, last year, five out of the six onshore wind auctions went undersubscribed. And I think that really illustrates the importance of streamlined and expeditious permitting in order to secure the future pipeline of projects because um, developers and investors can, can lose confidence when those market conditions aren't there. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to return to that issue of system value and wholesale prices. There's growing consensus from across and you know, above the industry that our current market design has to adapt to integrate larger share, shares of renewable energy. Um, that's because wholesale pr pricing mechanisms were designed around fossil fuel generation with, with very high marginal costs and they don't adequately or fairly assess the value of renewable energy, which come with near zero dispatch costs. So we're seeing increasingly volatile, sometimes negative prices as renewable penetration rates increase in places like Australia and California. Uh, this is going to become even more problematic as markets seek to ramp down support schemes for renewables um, because that makes generators for wind power even more reliant on wholesale prices. As a result, and um, if there's one thing to take away from this section of the webcast, it's this, wins cost competitiveness in wholesale markets is becoming a speed bump to new investment. It's actually threatening new investment in wind. And that's at a time when pub public policy is actually set in the opposite direction of travel. So um, markets should instead be emphasizing system value, uh, the net sum of positive factors like social value, low emissions, high market value, as well as negative factors like dispatch costs, grid enhancements, um, the cost of flexibility solutions, depending on the time and location of generation, and so on. Um, and this approach raises two related points. Um, energy pricing needs to account for the economic burden of fossil fuels. That's really important in order to um, adequately disincentivize new investment and demand in uh, existing or new fossil fuel generation. And then second, the movements towards zero subsidy procurements that we're seeing in markets like Denmark and Netherlands and the Netherlands um, should be approached with caution because they essentially call for long tenor investments based on revenues, which are based on wholesale power prices in the future. And these are increasingly difficult, if not impossible to predict, especially when you're facing technology evolution, uh, you know, changing supply stacks and markets, um, changing uh, conditions in global financial markets and global pandemics. So um, strong pricing means long-term visibility. Uh, and we've seen some positive developments like bilateral PPAs, corporate PPAs, as well as um, the contract for difference kind of model, um, which provide greater revenue certainty. Next slide, please. I'm gonna speed up here. So um, policy is of course an important enabling factor, um, particularly in emerging markets. Uh, ben mentioned Argentina and Mexico as examples of, of markets where um, they've been really affected by a wavering political will. South Africa is a, a, another good example, um, which saw strong uh, momentum in renewable energy from 2011 onward, but um, following announcements to expand the nuclear energy program in the country under the former administration around 2016, the wind sector development um, really halted. It's now getting back on track with its IRP to 2030, but it lost two or three years of of momentum and growth. Next slide. So um, that means taken all together, uh, we need an integrated approach to deliver the global energy transition. Um, and that means proactive reforms to our current market design because 
large scale deployment of wind around the world is not going to happen spontaneously. It needs all these different factors like sustainable pricing, um, incentives to divest from carbon intensive generation, long term policy stability and, and so on. Uh, and it's not just for the success of our of our industry, but also the success of wider transition strategies like sector coupling and and wide scale electrification. So um, I'm going to end here, but looking forward to hearing your comments and questions um, here or later by email. Thanks so much, Joyce, for that really interesting presentation. Um, so we have about 20 minutes here left for Q&A. If you haven't submitted your questions um, already, please do so in the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar. Um, here are a list of the experts that we have on hand to answer all of your questions. Um, so for the first question, I'm just going to get, we, we have coming from Sudesh, um, Suresh Kumar. Um, and he has a question um, on uh, how to, ex the major challenges um, in Asia Pacific and Latin America. So Sudesh, um, please go ahead and ask your question. Oh, looks like you might be having some troubles connecting to the audio here. Um, so let me just read out his question that he has. Um, so Sudesh's question was in emerging wind markets in Asia Pacific, except India and China and Latin America, what are the top challenges faced uh, in accelerating growth at Groundfield stage in offshore wind uh, from an industry point of view? Um, and also in terms of an investor point of view. Um, so I'll let uh, Li Ming Chao, our Asia director, um, uh, speak first on um, the Asia Pacific, especially the Southeast Asia region. And then Ramon Fiestas, our Latin America chair, can, can jump in afterwards to provide more info on, on Latin America. Thanks, Alisa, and thanks, uh, Sudesh, for, for this excellent question. Um, the, in Asia Pacific, in Southeast Asia specifically, uh, the main challenge is still regulatory, uh, which is why we set up the task force, Southeast Asia task force, as a main, um, main major um, venue or major measure to, to address the industry's policy concerns or policy needs. And under the Southeast Asia task force, we have been doing quite actively policy lobbies for the industry. And just to give a few examples, um, in Thailand, we um, help the industry to ask for the um, feed-in tariff or um, policy measures uh, to be clarified in the new PDP, um, as well as uh, target medium short-term target, uh, which already we have seen some progresses in the first draft of um, Thailand new PDP, which was uh, kind of released by the government a few a few weeks ago. We're still waiting for the final um, kind of uh, release of, of, of the final uh, PDP, which is kind of also delayed due to the COVID in Thailand. And in Vietnam, we're also trying very hard um, right now, um, as we speak, to push for a feed-in tariff extension or a government's clarification of feed-in tariff um, situation. And uh, this, um, this is also something uh, that we, um, after we, our first initial interaction with the Vietnamese government, that we also got a request that they want to see um, assessment of the COVID impact to the, to the industry, which we submitted our initial analysis to them last week. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the onshore challenge. For offshore, it's more like uh, it will take a time for the government to really understand the offshore. Um, and same thing for the policy, um, policy or regulatory kind of challenge. Um, so we, we're also doing a lot of things through our Southeast Asia task force and also the global offshore task force in educating the government uh, in the Southeast Asia countries on offshore. Um, then I think I'll hand, hand it back to Alisa and Ramon. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sudesh, for your for your question. Yeah, uh, in in Latin America, the situation is uh, fairly the same as in Asia. But you need to understand that um, there are different markets in in the region, 
and not all of them have the same, uh, let's say, problems or, or, or are tackling the same uh, pr problematic in order to deploy um, wind power. I would say, but in general terms, um, the big issue there is, um, as well as a policy issue, is, is related is related to um, um, to achieve somehow um, uh, policies in, in in the region that. That, that will provide uh, long-term and uh, I would say regular um, purchase mechanism for renewable energy. This is lacking in the region, uh, in many of the, the markets, and, and this is why um, it's, it's such unstable and, and up and down uh, each year with, with, with the, 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 if, if you look into the figures of, of install capacity. So policy issue would be for the industry, uh, the the main um, the main task to address what we are doing there is um, trying to lobby in the different um, in the different markets in order to provide them with all the figures and with all the the capacity in order to set um, the framework to to achieve this uh, regular purchase mechanism in certain markets we are trying to let's say to 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 uh, provide tools in order to to change the market rules in, uh, in order to 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 allow um, renewable energies to enter into into the market as this is the case in Colombia is probably the last and most recent market that is has been open in, in Latin America and this is uh, uh, really uh, due to to the understanding of 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 uh, the the change of policy in order to 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 open the electricity market to long term renewable energy purchase in in argentina happens uh, something similar in, in in the past years um, when um, we were um, working together with the government in order to set up a framework uh, for the renewable program uh, that means that in, in this case uh, the problematic was was a, a really a little bit different in order to provide uh, security for for all the cash flows and and and, and the, uh, the the cash flow models of of, of the contracts there in 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 a, in a framework in which um, there was no certainty uh, for the uh, recovery of of the of the investments. So, as I told before, uh, each market has its own um, necessity. But uh, uh, the overall picture is related to policy issues in, in each of the markets in order to, to ensure the continuity of uh, renewable energy investments and particularly for, for wind power. And for, from, for the investors and for the financiers, I would say the challenge is much more based on what we uh, call the legal stability or legal certainty of the jurisdictions. So in many cases, we have been seeing how um, retroactive decisions have been taken and, and somehow have uh, hit it dramatically the confidence of, of, of the investors and, and uh, destroyed or somehow disturbed the investment uh, environment in, in, in the countries, not only for wind power or for renewable energies, but as well for uh, different infrastructure investments. So in that sense, I would say that the, the challenge is more based on on keeping legal certainty and, and, and economic stability in, in, in the region in order to, um, uh, to maintain or to increase the investment environment for, for infrastructure investment, especially for, for new investments. This is for all onshore. Uh, I would say offshore is, 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 is a, I would say a completely new um, uh, driver for investments in, 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 in the region. There are um, there is only one market that is now uh, focusing um, on on offshore. This is Brazil, and uh, what we are trying is to approach the, the the biggest markets in the region in order to realize and to know them, let them know how is the offshore industry, how should be the offshore projects be developed, and, and most of them, as I told, are in the very early stages and much more concerned about. Um, um, getting the, the, the targets uh, with the onshore projects than looking into into offshore. But uh, I would say there is still a huge opportunity for offshore projects in, in the region. The conditions for offshore in many 
of the Latin America countries are excellent. Uh, not only Brazil, for sure, Brazil is one of the, the biggest, but, but as well Argentina and Colombia and Mexico. There are many um, uh, extremely good sites in order to, to, to develop offshore wind. But at the end of the day as well, this is something that needs to be uh, focused with a broader picture in terms of um, analyzing the, let's say, the, the, the barriers that, that are as well arising with grid infrastructure there in the region. So many of the markets are tackling with um, I would say grid infrastructure problems or, or, or grid uh, large scale uh, renewable energy integration into the grids. So in this sense, uh, what we are uh, doing in, 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 in the market is trying to, to uh, figure out a, a regional approach in order to bring um, the knowledge of flexibility in, into the region and, and, and to, to address this uh, in a very professional way in terms of of pro providing the right tools in order to, to perform the grid codes, first of all, uh, and then the planning codes in order to, to um, have a, a, a completely dif different, uh, as I say, picture of, of the electricity systems in, in, in the region. And, and this is, I would say, the main uh, challenges for the uh, industry and for investors in, in the region. Thank, thank you, Ramon, for that really comprehensive answer. Um, we'll now move on to the next question from Mark, who is joining us. Um, and he has a question on the impact of COVID-19 on the global wind industry. So over to you, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is on the impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, Ben mentioned the heat of approximately 15% over, you know, the 76 uh, gigabyte of new installed capacity uh, for 2020 that is uh, foreseen. Uh, my question was, um, do you think, wh which region do you think will be mostly impacted, APAC, America or, or Europe? Um, and uh, are we going to see a uh, the same 15% impact over the three regions, or do you think uh, one of the three regions is going to be more affected than others? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I think I'll hand it off to um, Fong and, and Ben to, to tackle this question. Ben, do you want to try first? So, um, I mean, it's very, uh, how you doing, Mark? And thanks for that. Thanks for that question, first of all. Um, I mean, I think it's very hard to make uh, predictions as we are, but um, if things stay as they are, um, paradoxically, I would expect China to suffer less um, in terms of you know, the impact because, I mean, firstly, because Wuhan, you know, the, the virus was, you know, disproportionately um, um, you know, uh, affected people in the area around uh, Wuhan, um, which is not one of the key wind areas. Um, as you know, you know, the, 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 the most, most important areas are the north and the coastal areas. Um, and um, secondly, because historically China's installations are very slow in January, and February anyway, because of Chinese New Year. So the fact that it happened then, the maximum disruption suggests to me that, you know, things being as they are, and if the virus continues under control in China, then China will get back on its feet very, very quickly. Um, and, and, you know, it has, has obviously made great efforts to continue with projects. Um, and there's still the same, you know, kind of factors uh, pushing um, the speed up in Chinese installations around the feed-in tariff. We're also seeing, I mean, if you look at um, the newspapers yesterday, you're already seeing a bounce back in Chinese industrial production uh, from the figures from yesterday. So, I mean, just logically, I would say at the moment, um, the effects probably um, going to be more accentuated in, uh, you know, Europe and the US than in um than in China, and obviously because China accounts for a large part of the growth, that you know you can kind of work out logically what that, what that's going to do to the numbers. 
I think that's about as far as I'd go at the moment. Thank you, Ben. Nothing. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I agree. I think in general, uh, we see uh, more impact here in Europe if we compare uh, with, with China. Uh, as I mentioned, China basically has been through the top process and get the virus uh, under control. Uh, in our GY, um, Kirk, uh, Sevilla, the Chinese Women Energy Association, we had a, a joint uh, update in terms of impact for China. We made the conclusion, if they can get the virus under control in the middle of March, we believe like two months extension. Uh, the day before yesterday, the local industry sent up the um, the letter to the Chinese central government asking for six months um, extension in terms of the actual when great connection uh, deadline. Uh, it's the same. Uh, they also ask for six months for offshore as well. Uh, challenge will be seen uh, in United States as well. It's mainly due to, uh, first of all, uh, the majority of the players um, Along American company, uh, so we have the uh, uh, Vistas uh, compete head head uh, head uh, with head with the GE renewable, and uh, both company uh, took the majority market share. And uh, uh, looking at the component, for example, let's take Gearbox for example. Uh, the Chinese NGC is the, the leading uh, supplier to GE, and also both ZF Energy, they stop producing new gearbox in the US. They have to get its export. Um, either from China, Europe, or India to their market. Um, right now, I'm uh, looking at the uh, European market. I think uh, if you follow the news, it's clear. Uh, factory mainly closed down uh, in the two uh, apex centers, uh, uh, Italy and Spain. Um, so uh, we have to re evaluate on the uh, country by country base. Um, for growth uh, in Africa, in Latin America, so far in terms of impact, it is relatively um, limited. Um, but as, as we mentioned, we're going to closely follow the uh, situation and provide the update uh, on our information hub. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, guys. We now uh, have another question coming from Hiran Shah, um, and he has some questions about the market outlook for India. So. Um, over to you, Haran. Hello. Is it audible? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as we know, for India, the government has an ambitious target of 60 gigawatt by year 2022. That means from 2019 till 2022, the uh, new installations, 24 gigawatt of wind. Now, looking at the challenges in terms of uh, power tariffs and land acquisition, how do we foresee uh, this uh, target being achieved and what would be the way ahead for the Indian market? Uh, thanks, Hiran. And I just want to pitch in here. As you know, that uh, the reverse bidding uh, played a little bit impact in the performance and the performance, as uh, Ben has mentioned. And your question was correctly because at that point of time, we know there was price cost, which was played a major role, which in OEMs was not uh, coming into the uh, project viability. But now after the reverse bidding, uh, the reverse cap, I mean, uh, the fixed tariff, the cap has been removed. Uh, we, we were anticipating the project will be backed into the shape. But however, uh, we know the current situation of this COVID uh, come to India and many factories have been on a lockdown situation. We anticipate a lot of uh, slowdown in the production as well as project development will take place. But as you rightly said, there'll be a big challenge uh, in having the target in fixing up ambitions, but uh, we have to be a little bit skeptical in achieving the numbers. But however, I think the government is playing a good role at this point in time. You know that finance ministry has uh, given a post major and, uh, you know, and things will be improving and we will definitely achieve the target in coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jay, for that. Um, Joyce, I don't know if you have anything to add uh, on to that answer as well. No, nothing to add. Um, let's try to move on to another question because uh, we only have five minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, just give me a second here. 
All right. So another question um, is from um, Ayush. Um, he doesn't have um, his audio and video enabled, so I'll just read out the question um, directly for him. And this one will be directed to Alistair, um, and it's about floating offshore wind. Um, so uh, the question is, are there any regions where uh, floating projects are being constructed on a commercial basis, and what's the, the outlook for floating? Thank you very much for the question. Um, so floating has moved a lot in the last 18 months. Um, back then, developers were not that keen on it, but anybody now with sort of a 10-year horizon sees floating as a key component. Certainly, in terms of global resource, it trebles the offshore wind resource if you bring floating into play. The areas are mostly development projects at the moment, but by the middle of the decade, you could well see some commercial scale projects coming through. When I say commercial scale, the first ones will be Norway with high wind tampon at 88 megawatts. Um, but moving on from that, we'll start to see 200 megawatt projects and back end of the decade, more like 500 megawatt projects. The key places, um, Japan, definitely, whilst it's a slow growing market, they uh, really get offshore winds and the water depths mean that floating will be the um, main technology. But also West Coast US, um, as we've seen, the US have really got offshore wind. You know, their targets last year were only nine gigawatts. Now they're 25 gigawatts and you can expect the um, market to move fast. It's just a characteristic of the US. So that's certainly another place to look. But even in the UK, the um, government that came in in December have specifically put in their manifesto to enable floating wind. And there is now a consultation out, which uh, closes in May, which is uh, from Bayes, which includes um, an idea, you know, the idea of giving floating wind a special um, contract for difference and therefore support. So it's not just about the where's the wind, where's the water depth, it's very much about where's the policy. But to go with those markets, uh, France certainly uh, is keen, um, South Korea on the east coast, you can, you know, their industrial capability to build floating is an impressive component. And then we'll see others come through behind that in terms of uh, Portugal, Spain, and if we look long way into, you know, into next decade, then we start to see some very interesting markets in places like South Africa and, and, and many other island states. But I, you know, I would say that um, get close with floating wind because those projects are gonna start to scale up um, towards the back end of this decade. Thanks a lot, Alistair. I think we have space for one more question. Um, so I'll shift back onto the uh, the COVID topic because I know that's at the top of everyone's minds. Um, PRT is no longer online, so I'll just read out the question for him. Um, and his question was uh, in regards to the government stimulus package that can be delivered um, for installation companies in the value chain for both onshore and offshore wind um, under the context of the COVID crisis. Um, so I'll, I'll pass this question over on to, to Joyce, who will, who will say an answer. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot has been said on this topic already. Uh, the extent to which um, this part of the value chain will be affected is still unclear. Uh, ben brought up a very interesting point about seasonality um, related to China, and I think for installation, operations, um, much of that activity and, and O&M, the, the maintenance activity for wind farms happens in the summer. So I think uh, we will, coming into you know, May, late May and June, if lockdown measures are lifted um, and you know, travel bans ease up, um, we might see some of that activity coming back online. And, and that means that the extent of uh, the downside will be moderated. Um, it will also depend, I, I'm not sure which market Kyoto was 
was asking about specifically, I'm not sure which country he's based in, but um, it will also depend on, on market specific stimulus packages, um, things for you know, businesses of different sizes, like uh, tax extensions, um, cash handouts for smaller businesses. Um, but I think there, there is reason to be fairly optimistic about um, a green stimulus. There's precedence for combining climate action with uh, fiscal stimulus. We can look back to um, the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, um, where one UN study found that around 16% of um, sti stimulus packages had green um, finance attached, which amounted to some $521 um, billion. So uh, I, I also think um, it's worth noting that in Europe, we've we have the Green Deal for Europe, which is kind of a landmark package, and the European Council has already committed to upholding uh, Green Deal commitments in their fiscal stimulus package um, for the pandemic. Um, since 2008, 2009, we've seen uh, you know, other instances of strengthening regional climate frameworks and international climate frameworks. Um, so, so I do think there's reason to be to be optimistic, and and GWEC is going to be actively engaging with governments and our stakeholder communities to ensure um, there's a place for wind in these packages. Thanks so much, Joyce, and we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, so the, the full report for the Global Wind Report is available on our website for download. Um, if you're a GWIC member, you can also get further uh, comprehensive insights in databases by logging into the members area. And I just also wanted to draw your attention to uh, the future webcasts we have coming up to, to keep you informed on all things in the global wind industry, um, even though you can't leave your apartment or, or your house. So uh, please, if you scan the QR code here, um, you can go to our website and, and see all the upcoming webcasts we have going on and, uh, and register and, and join us next time. Um, on behalf of GWEC, uh, I'd like to thank all of our, our team and panelists for joining and all of you from joining today uh, from across the world. And um, if you have any further questions, um, please follow up um, via email by sending a, a message to info at gwec.net and we'll be more than happy to answer any other questions you have. Um, thank you everyone and uh, have a great day. Thanks Elisa and thank you everyone. Thank you Ron. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.